Today we're going to talk about a very controversial subject, but uh, probably one of the most important videos I think I've ever done. Uh, years and years ago, I was studying the thing of this, all this mind control stuff that happened here in America, which I'll be talking about in this study. And uh, I heard Bill Schnevlin say that um, if you want to understand how mind control works, you should pick up a copy of this book right here. Let me show it on the camera. The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius. Okay. Uh, St. Ignatius, Profound Precepts of Mystical Theology. You know, and you have it's their uh, introduction by a, whenever you see an SJ, that means Society of Jesus. You're talk, dealing with a Jesuit there. So this book right here uh, is the foundation for all mind control. And uh, this is probably one of the most satanic books I've ever read. Uh, very, very, very evil um, because it basically makes self-righteousness, takes its self-righteousness to a whole new level. And um, we're going to start out today, first of all, we're going to actually, we need to start out with a word of prayer because this is, a, this is a very, very satanic book, and I just have a feeling that there is going to be some real spiritual attacks with this thing. And uh, so let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would please help me to do this study, uh, help me with... Um, saying the right things, Lord, and, and, and getting out what you want me to get out here. And, and uh, just, I'm really praying, Heavenly Father, that uh, there, there are people out there I know that are falling for systems of mind control. There are so many different aspects to it now. And, and I just really am praying, Lord, that you would, through this study, help them to be convicted and help them to get out of it. And uh, Lord, if there are any Jesuits watching this, as I expect that there will be, I pray, Lord, that they would realize their satanic nature um, because they are trying to literally imitate you. They are trying to become God uh, through this mind control. And, Lord, I just pray that you would, uh, your Holy Spirit would break down their pride and help them to realize their true condition of be being just another lost sinner. And, Lord, if they are past that, if they've gone beyond that and they're just the devil's fully in control of their minds, then I pray that you would confound them and uh, protect us from these very, very wicked satanic people. And uh, Lord, I just pray that all the saved out there would have ears to hear, Lord, and that, that uh, they would search, search these things in the scriptures and make sure that I'm telling the truth and compare things with scripture and not be bound by their feelings and emotions and and uh, opinions, Lord, but that they would look at this logically and rationally according to your word. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's begin by turning in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. If you know your Bible, you know where I'm going with this. See, a lot of people, we have kind of this Hollywood mentality of Satan here in America where Satan is the bad guy that lives in hell. And uh, he lives on a throne down there with, you know, skulls and evil and fire everywhere. And God's the good guy up in heaven. Uh, that's not entirely true. God is the good guy up in heaven. Uh, and he's, it's, you know, he's a lot more than just a good guy. But, but the point is that Satan is up there as well. Uh, Satan has to report before the throne before he can do anything. So, not quite what Hollywood tries to... Uh, show and portray and of course you can understand that Hollywood is predominantly controlled by Jesuits so Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 through 15 we're gonna see here what is true Satanism right not a bunch of goofy fornicating drug addicts wearing black and upside down crosses and doing devil salutes and all this other stuff and listening to heavy metal those aren't Satanists okay those are filthy fornicating drug addicts. All right. I'm going to show you what real Satanism is all about. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. Notice, okay, stop here for a minute. Verse 12 explains who Lucifer is. Verse 13 explains why he was cast out, you know, cast down to the ground, cut down to the ground there. Why? Now, he still has to go up and report, but the point is he lost that, that heavenly uh, 
standing that he used to have. He was the anointed cherub. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 28, I believe it is. Yeah, Ezekiel 28. He was an anointed cherub. He was right there by the throne. And he lost that position. Here's why. Verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay? And you say, well, what happens? Well, verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This great Satan that so many people worship through different systems, Satan is actually just going to end up just burning in hell like any other old lost sinner or drunken bum or prostitute or whatever else. Satan's going to hell. Not a very good uh, being to worship. But you see there, what is Satan? Satan is a counterfeit. He tries to counterfeit who God is. And I'm going to show you today in this study, this spiritual exercises book basically gets Jesuits or anybody who goes through this training, this mind control training, it gets them to a point where they are doing the same thing. They are trying to be God for themselves. And it's a, it's really, really, really dangerous stuff. I mean, like I said, this is not something I recommend that people read. I'm just simply showing this thing because it's so important. This is key to so much that's going on in our world today, this thing of mind control. Mind control, if you don't know this, mind control has become a way of life, uh, especially if you live in America. I mean, the UK is really bad as well, but a lot of, I mean, a lot of nations, it's, it's real bad. <laughs> Mind control is at an all-time uh, level that you can't even fathom. People 100 years couldn't even imagine the nightmare that we live in right now. And so many of us, we've been born into it, so it, it's like, oh, it's not that bad. Uh, it's a lot, more than you a lot worse than you realize, excuse me. But I want you to notice, verse 13, let's count. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and finally, I will be like the most high. How many eyes are there? Five. Remember that number. That's going to be important. Okay. Turn next to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now look at verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves righteous. Yeah, righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay, salvation on its most simple form is you coming to the foot of the cross and when you get there realizing I can't save myself and Christ's righteousness is what saves you. Okay, what this book does, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the actual quotes from it here in just a couple minutes. What this book does is it brings the exisertent, or ex, I'm not even sure how they pronounce it, retreatant, the people, the one that's there to be mind controlled. It brings them to a point where they come to the cross and they understand that they're sinners. They understand that Jesus died for them. And instead of turning to Jesus Christ and his righteousness, they turn to their own righteousness. Very, very dangerous. Self-righteousness is the single most uh, dangerous thing, the thing that will damn more people to hell than anything else. And right here, I realize that there were self-righteous people before Ignatius uh, of Loyola there, uh, before he showed up. I realize that, but he really defines it here. And, you know, you read about the life of, of this nut here that wrote this book, and he was always having contact with different spirits. And this saint came and told me this and said, the guy was so filled with devils, it was ridiculous. You know, I believe it was Satan himself that actually channeled a lot of this stuff. 
just really, really, really crazy. And um, just to give you a little foretaste of what's coming up here at the end of this uh, study, I am actually going to have a special guest uh, join me uh, to talk about their past, that they actually were right at the brink of going into the spiritual exercises. Uh, they were basically in that system, and they were going to go through it. And the Lord, in His mercy, pulled them out before that happened. So that'll give you something to look forward to. But uh, let's let's look at some things here from this. And I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly um, because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this thing because it's very, very bad. But uh, I'll show you this thing again here on screen. Zoom in here and I'll start to show you some of this stuff. I always put my little warnings in there for after the rapture. I just make these things on my computer, print master program. I put the little skull image there and I put a warning. And this book is satanic. It is to be used for documentation purposes only. You know, so don't want anybody confused that's left behind. Here you have this Robert Gleason uh, Jesuit there, Society of Jesus. The central positive principle is the imitation of Christ our Lord. Achieving Christian perfection, the retreatant to purify his soul. See, it's not Jesus Christ purifying you. It's you purify your own soul. And then it talks about purifying the heart. Even though Jesus Christ talked about the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. But you can purify your heart if you have the right, if you go through the right formula and if you do the right things. Sure you can. But... Uh, up here, notice this. The central positive principle is the imitation of Christ our Lord. And you will see that with these satanic cults. And I'm going to be talking in the future. I've been giving little hints about this. I'm going to be talking about the Amish. And a lot of the, uh, what they call Anabaptist. And they're not Anabaptist, by the way. But these groups, Amish, Mennonite, Hutterite, uh, Br uh, Bruderhof. A lot of these groups, you will talk to them. And I've talked to them. I was raised around them. Uh, my ancestors actually go back into that, you know, the Mennonite system, which is actually kind of the Mennonites, and then all these other ones kind of broke off from the Mennonites, the Hutterites and the Bruderhof and the Amish. They're all branches of the Mennonites. So, you know, I have a history in that thing, so I do know what I'm talking about. But you talk to these people, and they'll talk over and over and over again about imitating Christ. And, oh, it's just the life of Christ, and the life of Christ, uh, where we should seek to, to follow Him and His example and everything else. What about the Pauline epistles? You know, oh, well, I prefer the Sermon on the Mount. Sure you do. Because uh, the blood of Jesus Christ and His death on the cross is nowhere in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount was given as the uh, sort of way people are going to live in the Millennial Kingdom when Satan is bound and in the bottomless pit for the thousand years. But let's continue here. Here you have Introduction to the Spiritual Exercises. I love this. It says, probably almost every Christian knows the story of the conversion of St. Ignatius. <laughs> you know, Catholics are Christians. Yeah, sure they are. Ignatius as an instrument in the Counter-Reformation. So again, this isn't conspiracy stuff that we're dealing with here. Now, I mean, it's real conspiracy, but you get these people to try to discredit this type of thing. They call me nuts because I'm always like saying about the Jesuits are behind this and the Jesuits are behind that, trying to get everybody back under Roman Catholicism. But it says it in their own book. Okay? The book that was written here, now this is this introduction here is written by another Jesuit, but the point is, it's their purpose. They openly admit it. You know? They want to bring everybody back under control of Roman Catholicism. And, you know, where a lot of people get confused is they... They think, well, if it's a branch of Roman Catholicism, then they'd have to celebrate the Mass, and they'd have to believe in, you know, the Eucharist, you know, the whole Mass thing there. They have to do all that stuff. No, no. Catholicism as a system, you get up into the hierarchy of Catholicism, they don't believe what, the, what their own system teaches, you know. I mean, you get a lower-level Catholic, and they say, you know, Lucifer is bad. You go up to the highest levels, they're doing Easter Masses and, and dedicating things to Lucifer, you know, praying to Lucifer. I've, I've had that in other studies. You know, see, Luciferians, true Luciferians, 
All they want is multiple systems out there where everybody believes that they can become God. They get into the system of self-righteousness. They don't care if you're Amish. They don't care if you're Catholic. They don't care if you're Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever, Muslim. They don't care. Buddhist, you know, anything. As long as you believe that you can save yourself, you're never going to come to the Lord in a broken, contrite state, a repentant state for salvation. So whatever the system of self-righteousness is, Roman Catholicism is for it. That's why you had the Pope, you know, here just the last year or so, and he's saying you can't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's dangerous. You have to have the church, a church of some kind, you know, any, you know, take any of the ones that we've designed. That's all the Counter-Reformation is. But let's continue here. Page 14, you can see it there. Go down here. The aim of the second week, it's four weeks, by the way, the, these uh, spiritual exercises. The aim of the second week is to persuade the ex to an interior knowledge and love of the person of Jesus Christ, so that he may adapt his life to the model, identify himself with Christ as the concrete norm of Christian perfection. Okay, now this is not the same thing as our salvation as Bible-believing Christians, where we say, yeah, I identify myself with Christ because he died for my sins and his righteousness is imputed to me. Okay, you'll never find imputed righteousness in this whole thing. Imputed righteousness is Jesus Christ did something for us when we can't do it for ourselves. He paid a debt that we can't possibly pay. They don't believe in this. Okay, the Jesuit model here, this whole model, this, this thing is you yourself can pay for your own sins if you go through these exercises four weeks of exercise, and it, it can go, it doesn't have to be four exact weeks, it can go longer, it can go a little bit shorter than that. But the point is, they have these exercises, all these weird things that they're going to, I'm going to show you that they do, that they suggest, and you can get through it, and you can be just like Jesus Christ. Be your own Christ. And of course, the Catechism even teaches that. You know, that you can become a God, and you can, of course, become Christ. And every Catholic priest out there, according to the Catechism, Every Catholic priest out there is another Christ. That's what they teach in the Catechism. I've put that out in multiple studies. But let's continue here. Page 15. The kingdom meditation is designed to arouse the greatest enthusiasm, enthusiasm for close following of Christ in poverty and humility. The following of Christ in service to the church. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, okay. That is buzzwords there that are going, you know, all the cults will use this thing. And, you know, when I was reading this thing, uh, my wife and I were dealing personally with some of the Amish in this area. Here, there are Amish communities up in northeastern Maine. And uh, you hear the same thing. Oh, well, I believe that we're just to follow the role of, of Christ and we're to imitate Christ and, and everything. And we're bringing in his kingdom and we're building his kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. Uh, there is no kingdom right now other than the spiritual kingdom, the fellowship between God and man, God and saved man, I should say. Excuse me. You know, we're not building any kind of a kingdom here. All right. All our job is, as Christians is to do right now is to tell people about salvation, to witness for Jesus Christ, get them saved, and then we're going to be leaving the catching way of the bride of Christ. We're leaving. And then the Antichrist is unleashed on the earth. And he has his kingdom. And then Jesus Christ comes back and destroys him. And we come with him. And then the Lord Jesus sets up his kingdom. Jesus sets it up. Okay? Not Christians being good communitarian communists down here on the earth. And let's all just, you know... Uh, live a life of suffering and pain and poverty and all these other Catholic vows. But let's continue. Down further here on the page it says, leads to his final end, the possession of God. Okay? The following of Christ in service to the church. And you can, you can pause this and read this whole thing, but it says the final end there is the possession of God. So it's not faith in Jesus Christ that gets you saved and, and God, you know, you become in fellowship with God. Oh, no, no. It's your uh, service to the church. Sure. 
And by the way, you know, you say, well, okay, but I'm an independent fundamental Baptist, so I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. It should concern you when you start to hear a lot of the independent fundamental Baptist brethren using the exact same language. You need to be part of the local church. You need to be in the church. Don't you dare question the church. Don't mess with the man of God. All this other stuff. I wonder why they'd be talking just like Catholics, just like Jesuits. There's no conspiracy. Don't worry about conspiracies. They're, they're crazy. They're the realm of crazy people. Down further here, crowning the whole work of the exercises is the contemplation to obtain love. <laughs> Don't you love that? Which synthesizes, yeah, synthesizes the movement of the four weeks so that one's, one lives one's life exclusively, exclusively for God in joyous service, finding Him in all things and all things in Him. Oh boy. Gotta love that too. Little Nice little paganism thing there going on. Finding Him in all things and all things in Him pantheism you know essentially it's just like sure but again you see that you know how many of us have relatives that do that you should have more love don't be so judgmental we all need to love uh-huh yeah <laughs> page 16 um here's talking about ignatius here uh, this nut that wrote the book resume his schooling studying philosophy there it talks about philosophy again He's studying philosophy, you know. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Well, Ignatius de Loyola was certainly spoiled. Rotten. Page 18. Egyptian monks of the desert, these monks whose heroic renunciation appealed to him so strongly, were seen by Ignatius as the most chivalrous knights of the cross of Christ. Okay, so you have, again, uh, the Jesuits... Basically, Ignatius was a soldier in the Spanish army, and he's also seeing these, you know, other monks here as, as uh, knights of the cross. The Jesuit order is a military order. Uh, military, you know, they 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 are involved in a lot in the temporal um, powers of the Vatican, not just the spiritual, but also the temporal. Okay, that's a whole other thing, though. Then farther on the page here, Ignatius described himself at this period as possessing a heart inflamed with love of God. Sure, the God of this world, perhaps. Through his future writings, phrases like the greater glory of God and what more can I do for Christ and what conduces more to the salvation of my soul will occur repeatedly. What conduces more to the salvation of my soul? In other words, what else can I do to save myself? Um, it only takes one step to save yourself. Come to the Lord as a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness saves you, not your own. Here, page 19, Augustinian theology. Love of God culminates in contempt of or disregard for self. The Augustinian phrase is heard again in the Ignatian colloquially. Um, which seeks the grace to bear insults and wrongs in imi imitation of the divine majesty. There again, you have, you're to imitate God. You're to imitate Jesus Christ. And how? Uh, bearing insults and wrongs. And again, you see this pacifistic, uh, you know, conquer through love thing. This, this, this whole mess that a lot of these cults are into, especially like you have the Amish. And... Uh, similar cults. Down here farther it says, There can be no doubt that the inspirations of the Holy Spirit were responsible for the final form which Ignatius gave to his little book. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, like the Holy Spirit's going to inspire this satanic nonsense. I don't think so. Page 20. If the exercer, exercitant, whatever, I don't know how to say a dumb word. I don't really care either, but uh, if the exercitant does not show aptitude for proceeding beyond an ordinary good Christian life, he should not be given the exercises of the second week, but should end his retreat here with a good confession and practical reform of life. If, however, he seems likely to profit by making the whole four weeks, then he may be led on by his director to a further exploration of the implications of the kingdom. Okay. Now, this book here, by the way, is more written for people that are running retreats, not so much for the... Uh, 
ignorant person that comes in there, the ex or tent or whatever. You know, the person that just is coming in to have their mind controlled. This is more telling them how, a uh, retreat master telling them how to brainwash people, essentially is what this book is. But, you know, again, you see the, the military mind control philosophy here. Okay, you have somebody that comes in and they don't show the proper aptitude to be mind controlled. They still have a conscience or, or whatever. And what you do is you just simply say, um, oh yes, you did a really good job, you know, and, and uh, we'll give you an honorable discharge from the military here. You served your time. Thank you. You don't really offer them higher positions. Okay. You don't say to them, hey, uh, would you like to have a top secret security clearance? Or would you like to come to the retreat? Or would you like to this? Or would you like to that? You don't say that stuff to people that don't have an aptitude to be higher level in the Jesuit order. See? Very interesting. But let's continue. Down here further on the page. A more general end is service of the church, learning in all things to love and to serve Jesus Christ and so to attain salvation and happiness by imitating Jesus Christ. Next sentence there, by imitating Jesus Christ. So again, you're attaining salvation. How? Imitating Jesus Christ. Hate to break it to you, but you can't imitate Jesus Christ. At least not in terms of your salvation. Yes, you can go out there. Yes, you can preach the gospel and things. You can get hated the way Jesus was. Uh, you can stand for the word of God. You, you know, Yeah, you can do those things. But you can't imitate Jesus Christ in terms of living and dying like he did and obtaining salvation as a result. Never going to happen. No way. I mean, he did not come to this world to live by example and so that we could follow his example to one day attain salvation. That's not why Jesus Christ came here to this earth. Jesus Christ came to die so we might have life through his death. Page 21. The exercises as St. Ignatius conceived them were intended to be useful to many classes of people, but they were especially directed at more generous souls from whom greater service and love of God might be hoped. If one follows the spirituality of the exercises generously, he will be led to sanctity, even to the heights of evangelical perfection. He'll be like God, in other words, gifted with mystical prayer and almost continual union with God. Talking about Ignatius. Mystical prayer. And we're going to see about that later on. Down here. Service of the church through complete conformity to the will of God. Again, how many of us have heard that going to Babel buildings over the years? You need to serve the church if you want to find the will of God. It's right there. Again, imitation of Christ. You know, an imitation of Christ, by the way, is a counterfeit. Interesting. Down here. He will then be disposed to make use of creatures only insofar as they lead him to God. Okay. So in other words, you basically just use people. St. Ignatius lays great stress on this practical disposition of soul, which he calls indifference, since it is an absolute pr practical, practical prerequisite for genuine, realistic progress in the spiritual life. In other words, you kill your conscience. To a Jesuit, one of, their, one of the mottos of Jesuitry is the ends justifies the means. If you have to fornicate with somebody to get your objective, if you have to murder people to get your objective, if you have to go in and destroy people financially, destroy their character, whatever you have to do to achieve the objective, you cannot have a conscience. You know, as they say, you have to have ice water in your veins. You can't have any feelings for people. Complete, total indifference. Page 22, Ignatius has no intention of fostering illusions. Sure. Perfect silence must be maintained or the retreat cannot be called Ignatian, no matter how closely the book of the exercises is otherwise followed. So you're going to see this thing of a lot of mind control types of things. You'll see meditation, things like that, you know, being that will enter you into a kind of an altered state of consciousness. You know, 
verse, or, yeah, verse 23, page 23, the same basic ideas of detachment from honors and worldly goods. Again, what are the Amish? What are the a lot of the Mennonites, a lot of the Hutterites and the Bruderhof and these groups like this? You know, you have to give up your finances. You have to give up your riches. You have to give up photo albums. You have to give up automobiles. You have to give up electricity. You have to give complete detachment from worldly goods. You know, written almost 500 years ago by the founder of the Jesuit order. Page 24. Jesuit priests do precisely this for their annual retreat. Or you're going on a retreat every year if you're a Jesuit priest. Laymen and lay women who decide to make an Ignatian retreat usually do so at a retreat house under the direction of a retreat master. Now this is what I was talking about, okay? And later on, my special guest actually was invited to that. And uh, But this book here is mostly for the retreat master, the one that is actually mind controlling the people, putting them through the process of mind control. Page 26, Pope Pius XI's Mens Nostra, which calls the book of the exercises a most wise and universal code of laws for the direction of souls in the way of salvation and perfection, showing the way to secure amendment of morals and the summit of the spiritual life. All that fancy talk means this thing tells you how to save yourself at least in your own warped, delusional mind. Next page over here, 28. The soul itself is in, a, is in readiness for a metanonia, meto, yeah, metanoia, whatever, a new conversion. Going through the exercises, you're ready to convert yourself. Next page, page 29, you have the imitation of Christ again. Christ's perfection gradually informing the entire supernatural life giving new meaning to single virtues, uniting various spiritual efforts under one dynamic principle, one moving intuition. Again, you know, you're seeing it there. Come to the foot of the cross, and instead of looking to Jesus Christ and saying, I'm going to put my faith in his death, burial, resurrection on that cross to save me, oh no, you come to the cross and you say, I can do better than that. You know? Sure you can. Page 31. The one making the retreat should sever himself from ordinary occupations and preoccupations, allowing himself to be absorbed by Christ, to live in the atmosphere of Christ's life, silencing the memory, the imagination, the impulses of the heart, where these do not help the work of absorption in Christ, is a primary necessity. So again, you're going to see these uh, ultra radical Catholic monastic systems, and it's all this thing of putting down the flesh and, and giving up this and giving up that and all that stuff. And you know, let me just make this point I'm not against giving up certain things, okay? I think that there are some aspects of non electric life and some aspects of, of walking instead of driving everywhere. Some of that stuff is fine, but if you're doing it to attain salvation, then it's blasphemy then it's wicked, then it is satanic at that point in time. Okay, over here we have uh, Ignatius did not intend this work to be a literary masterpiece, but rather a solid working tool for those who wish to enter into the serious work of their salvation. Saving yourself, in other words. I like this too, this prayer that you're supposed to pray here, the anima Christi, blood of Christ, inebriate me. Well, you can do that if you're a Catholic because you're drinking alcoholic wine as, you know, the blood of Christ. So if you get inebriated, that means drunk. So blood of Christ, you know, inebriate me, make me drunk. Sure, okay, yeah, that's real spiritual. But over here we have, this is the beginning of it here, it says... You know, talking about thus insurance, ensuring the salvation of his soul. So again, we see the work salvation thing. Um, this is page 38. Uh, or be more disturbed or tried by different spirits. The exercises should be completed in about 30 days. You're going to see this thing too about different spirits coming and trying to disturb them and stuff like this. You know, and tried and things by different spirits. 
Yeah. I, I guarantee you, you go through something like this, you're going to have so many devils in you when you come out of it. Bad news. Page 39, the rules of the first and second week on the discernment of spirits. Like you could actually do that, you know, when you're lost. But check this out. Exercising himself in the illuminative way. Now, many people understand this that have understood the conspiracy thing. But if you're new to this, uh, the Illuminati that you hear about. Uh, this group of one world government people that are building this new world order that's going to eventually be run by the Antichrist. This Illuminati, they were originally, it's the Jesuits. The Jesuits originally were calling themselves the Illuminati. Okay, Los Illuminados in Spanish if, because he was from Spain. And the Pope said, no, I don't like that. We'll call you the Society of Jesus. I mean, doesn't that sound so much more spiritual and nice, you know? And you say, well, then where did the real Illuminati come from? Well, Adam Vesopt, a Bavarian professor, professor in Ingolstadt, and uh, he was a Jesuit. Imagine that, you know. So, and where did he get his principles for the Illuminati? Founded there in Bavaria, you know, back in 1776. Where did he get his ideas and principles? We're looking at it right now. Let's continue. Page 40. Thus he will accustom himself not only to resist the adversary, but even to vanquish him completely. Oh, wow, isn't that nice? So when you, when you start to get into this and this deep, and it's all this deep you know, meditation and, and thinking of this and thinking that and imagining, it's all this deep mental thought stuff is what the spiritual exercise is all about. And you can actually get to a point where you vanquish completely the adversary. You know? And of course, they're speaking about Satan there. But, uh, you know, you'd have to be pretty crazy to think that you could vanquish Satan in this life, you know. Sure. Especially when Satan's past, present, and future is all written about in the Bible. But going down here, next paragraph or two, it says, A good work done under vow is more meritorious than one done without vow. Uh huh. Down here you have your religious life, you know, and all other forms of evangelical perfection. See, it's your works that will lead to perfection. It's not the blood of Jesus Christ. Page 42. Weekly confession of his sins is also to be recommended, and if possible, Holy Communion every two weeks, or better, if he is so inclined every week. This method of giving the exercises is best suited to those who are illiterate or poorly educated. Each commandment should be explained, and also the deadly sins, the precepts, precepts of the church, the use of the five senses and the works of mercy. Again, throughout so much of these spiritual exercises, you're going to see that number five. Five this, five that. And it's all through Catholicism. Five mysteries of the rosary. Five of this, five of this. Five, 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 five. five. Hmm. And if you understand numbers in the Bible, the system of numbers in the Bible, it's not some kind of a cult thing. There's a definite system of numbers in the Bible. Uh, the number seven in the book of Revelation, probably one of the more obvious, the number six, six, six. The number six is the number of a man, you know. So there is a system of numbers in the Bible. Nine uh, different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, definitely there. The number five many times will relate to the number of death. It will lead to death, things like that. So very interesting. Page 43. In these exercises, as a general rule, general rule, he will profit all the more if he is separated from all of his friends and from all worldly cares. Interesting. Just like a lot of the Amish do. They live in special communities and they're separated from worldly cares, you know. And again, you know, I'm not promoting television or saying, you know, it's wrong for them to stay away from TV or radio or whatever else. I'm not saying that. Television is mind control. The radio many times is mind control. The, the music and stuff on it's filthy. You know, I'm not saying that you should mess with that stuff. Again, it's a good thing to stay away from television. But not if you are doing that as a good work to obtain salvation. It doesn't work that way. Okay, let's continue here. Principle and foundation. 
man is created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord, and by this means to save his soul. Praising, reverencing, and serving God is never going to save anybody. Okay? doesn't work. Therefore, he must make, we must make ourselves indifferent to all created things. Look at there, right there. And, you know, the way that this thing is written, you know, I realize that somebody could go through this and read this and come out going, I don't see it as mind control. It's just, you know, service as a Christian or something. I understand that. But the point is, if you get somebody that really understands, you know, what's going on, somebody that's really, really sick in the head, like the Jesuits are, we must make ourselves indifferent to all created, created things. Kill without any conscience. Destroy without any conscience at all. I thought this was interesting too here, page 50. Um, I presuppose that I have three kinds of thoughts in my mind. The first is a thought which is my own, which comes solely from my own liberty and will. The other two come from without, the one from the good spirit and the, one, and the other from the evil one. I thought you could vanquish the evil one. But the evil one's giving you, putting certain thoughts in your mind. That's nice. Page 52. Nothing should be said to defame or slander another. If I reveal a hidden mortal sin committed by another, I sin mortally. If I reveal another, another's hidden venial sin, I sin venially. Hmm. Kind of like when you become a master mason and you're sworn to secrecy to protect and defend your other brother master masons and a lot of the other secret societies. Hey, don't you tell what I did. I got dirt on you. You have dirt on me. You tell, you tell on me, I'm going to tell on you. That's how cults are run. That's how secret societies are run. And it, I mean, it's in so many branches. It's in the military. It's in the universities. It's in, in a lot of religious cults and things like this. It's all over the place. And again, remember, remember, you say, well, yeah, okay, so some of this stuff lines up with this book here. Yeah, but remember, this book was written almost 500 years ago. Where did all these new philosophies come from? Where did all this, these systems of control, these religious cults and everything, where did they all come from? Hmm. And uh, the Mennonites came after this. So did the Amish. The Amish came out of the Mennonites. So did the Hutterites. So did the Bruderhof. Let's continue. Same page, page 52. The subject matter is the Ten Commandments, the precepts of the church, the recommendations of superiors. Oh boy. Any action committed against any of these three groups, superiors, you know, um, is a more or less serious sin according to the gravity of the matter. For we would not sin lightly if we acted or caused others to act against such pious recommendations and exhortations of superiors. Hey, 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 don't you speak against the man of God. Who are you to question the preacher? You know, you, you sit there and you be quiet. You don't have the authority of the pastor, okay? You be quiet. Don't speak against the man of God. Have you ever heard that before? You say, well, brother, but I'm a Baptist. I hear that in my Baptist church, but it, that's not Catholic. Baptists aren't Catholic. Or, and I pick on the Baptists, you know, and, but, I mean, make it any denomination out there. You'll get this same thing. You're not a preacher. You know, who are you to question? Don't you question authority? Uh, well, I can question authority, you see, because I have a perfect standard. Right there. I have an authoritative standard that I can question anyone. This thing is God. God's writing here. The Word of God. So yes, I can question. And you can too. I thought this was kind of interesting, a little thing here, page 54, seeing with the mind's eye. You know, people say, oh, that's just an expression. Well, if you're into the occult, you know it, it's kind of a subtle reference to so, some spiritual powers that are not from the Lord. Uh, page 58, here we have the third exercise, uh, that I may know the world and be filled with horror of it, and I may put away from me worldly and vain things. Again, you're going to see that with monastic type of cults. These, uh, all this different stuff. These, you know, well, I'm not doing that because that's worldly and whatever else. And they're doing it to save themselves. 
That's the whole point. Then the, uh, the fifth exercise there, you know, five again, number five. This is a meditation on hell. Okay, and you do all this different stuff here. I'll just kind of show you some of this. You know, and see, this is what you're supposed to do. You're to hear the wailing. You're to smell the smoke. You're to taste bitter things. You're just supposed to sit there in this, in this trance, and you're supposed to imagine all this stuff in your mind. And, you know, this was written 500 years ago, but today we have the uh, benefit, you know, to these mind controllers. They actually have uh, movies and, and video and stuff like this that they can do. They can help you to envision all this stuff and mess up your mind. Page 61. I will not think of pleasant and joyful things as heaven, the resurrection, etc. It would be better for me to keep in, my, in mind that I want to feel sorrow and pain, remembering death and the judgment. For the same reason, I will deprive myself of all light. I will neither, neither laugh nor say anything that will provoke laughter. Exterior penance is the fruit of interior penance and is the punishment we inflict upon ourselves for the sins committed. Exterior penance is the fruit of interior penance. So in other words, you understand all this horrible stuff and understand that you're a sinner, understand that you need, you know, you desire, to, or excuse me, you deserve to go to hell. You understand all that, but that's not enough. You have to begin to ex inflict exterior pain and torture. You say, well, Brian, that just, that, that's not talking about that, just talking about putting down your flesh. Oh, really? Here we have page 62. It is penance when we deny ourselves what is suitable for us. By chastising the flesh, thereby causing sensible pain, this is done by wearing hair shorts, cords, or iron chains on the body, or by scourging or wounding oneself, or by other kinds of austerities. What seems the most suitable and safest thing in doing penance is for the pain to be felt in the flesh without penetration to the bones, thus causing pain but not illness. I mean, why do you do this? Well, exterior penances are performed principally to produce three effects. To satisfy for past sins, not Jesus Christ taking care of your sins, but you do it yourself. To overcome ourselves, to seek and find some grace or gift that we wish to obtain. That's what religious cults do. You got to come in here and you got to destroy your health to volunteer. It's your work to it's your week to clean the church, isn't it? It's you you got to go out and do soul winning, you got to teach Sunday school, you got to be in choir, you got to this, you got to that, you got to do all this other stuff. And you end up destroying yourself, you destroy your family because you always have to be in church every time the doors are open. Or how about if you're Amish or some of these other cults like that and they put on uh polyester clothing that doesn't breathe for anything in the summertime and you got to wear all these long clothes and everything else and you're working out there in the fields and using you know primitive technology and, and things and not you know good the, the the right way I mean there are some things that you know using primitive technology is good but again out there suffering in the heat and, and the pain and everything else to merit your salvation you see and then apply it to the military. Sleep deprivation. You're not eating right. You're, you're having some guy, drill instructor, this far from your face, screaming in your face, being put down. You're useless. You worm. You maggot. You, you, know. you see? Pain, pain, pain. Obstacle course. Your muscles are sore. Your pain. You run, jog, run. You know, you gotta, you gotta run with a 70 pound, you know, or more pack on your back, and you got a gas mask on. You can barely breathe. You see? You see how all this stuff ties in? And remember, again, we're dealing with a 500-year-old book. Okay? This thing was written long before all this modern stuff came out. Pain is used in mind control. Let me just take a break for a minute here. I'm going to show you some other things real quick on the overhead camera. Um, if you have not heard about this, I know a lot of people are, are very ignorant of what has happened here in the past. And... You know, I just want to say this kind of in somewhat of a defense of, of Americans. <laughs> um, I know a lot of other countries get irritated at Americans and they say, you know, how stupid the average American is. And I understand. But um, 
I just would like to have some grace uh, from some of the other countries out there because um, we are under very heavy mind control here and we have been for a very long time. Okay, so uh, try not to blame us too much for some of the stupid things that Americans are doing because they're under mind control. And there are those of us that have broken out of a lot of the systems of mind control, but there are some things we just, we're getting hit with things and we've been through mind control in our past and things like that. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. But let me just show you this article here. Uh, Army intelligence official is also a satanic priest. This is a news article here. Devil worshiper holds sensitive army post and top brass say no problem. You say, who is this? Ex-Green Beret Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino is a high priest of a satanic church. The Temple of Set is the high priest position that he holds. Over here it says, a senior U.S. military intelligence officer with a secret, sec or secret security clearance admits he also he's also the founder and high priest of a satanic church. And amazingly, the Ar army says, no problem. Okay. Now, the story on this guy, this Michael Aquino... Uh, he was formerly the second in command of the Church of Satan under um, Anton LaVey. And he said basically the Church of Satan wasn't serious enough, so he founded the Temple of Set. And this guy is working in psychological warfare operations for the army. You know, that's real good. You know, uh, ways to control people's minds. And I had a brother, uh, Matt Quigley, actually, that um, brought out a video years ago. And his channel got taken down from YouTube. You know, I wonder why, but uh, he brought out this, this video that there was a Baptist pastor, independent, fundamental Baptist, you know, King James only pastor. And the guy, his secular job that he had, along with being a Babel building hireling, his secular job was he was the, an army officer of deception. And he was winning awards, deception officer of the, of the year. Again, psychological warfare. I had a friend uh, down in Pennsylvania, um, a brother down there, used to be part of our house church, and he went used to go to this, you know, independent Bible church. And while he was there, there was a man that was teaching Sunday school who was also with Army Intelligence, and he was bragging about how that when they went over to Iraq, they took over the television stations over there and started to broadcast propaganda and mind control. He was bragging about it. And the guy's teaching Sunday school at an independent Bible church. Insane. But here, I did this years and years ago, here we have a list of MKUltra unclassified documents, including sub-projects. Uh, this is from the National Security Archive, uh, Gelman Library, the George Washington University, Washington, D.C., blah, 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 all this other stuff. And these are the files where, um, again, if you don't understand this thing of MK Ultra, I know people are new to this. Um, way back in, after World War II, um, the Nazis were experimenting with this thing of mind-controlling people to make a super soldier. Somebody that can kill without any conscience, you know, uh, like we were reading about over here in the Spiritual Exercises book. You know, you don't even, you have no conscience at all. You don't even think about people. You know, and the Nazis were experimenting with this, ways that they could chemically um, torture people and, and put them on drugs and whatever else. That program was brought over here to America after the war, and they started to experiment on people. And this went on for many, many years. Let me show you another little thing here uh, from my files. This is actually the, the guy who was the head of the um, operation, this is an obituary in 1999. You can see here, CIA's Gottlieb ran LSD mind control testing. Sidney Gottlieb. This is him in 1977. This is his obituary. He's dead and frying in hell right now. Uh, he died at 80 years old. And it goes on in this article to talk about how that they would, these guys working for the CIA, they've, they actually developed LSD, the drug LSD, and they would use this thing on people. They would go to bars and stuff and they'd put it in people's drinks and then see what would happen to them. They were actually spiking each other's coffee in the lab where these guys were working, these CIA, you know, scientists, essentially. And, I mean, it's all admitted. And it got such to be such a big thing that they actually had 
Senate hearings on this. And um, I'll just show you this real quick here. These are all the different file names. Um, but here we have the joint hearing before the Select Committee on Intelligence and the Subcommittee on Health and Scientific Research um, of the Committee on Human Resources, United States Senate, 95th Congress, 5th, 1st Session, August 3rd, 1977. This is, you know, from the government's own website, and there are archives. This is not some kind of contrived thing. And it goes on, and you have... Uh, you have people that are testifying there before Senator Kennedy, Mr. Goldman, and they're going through and they, they admitted, openly admitted in all these files, you know, that they were conducting mind control experiments. So this stuff is not, you know, well, I, you know, it's just kind of conspiracy stuff. It's never been proved or whatever else. Uh, no, no, um, it's real. And the base, the whole basis for MK Ultra Mind Control programming, is right there. These spiritual exercises, and the key to the whole thing, and I'm going to talk about this in another video. The basic formula of mind control, and it's in so many stratas of our society. That's why I need to talk about this. That's why I need to do more um, studies and things on this because it's so important. Because we've all been under mind control at different times, and as Christians. We have a different system that can overpower and overcome the power of mind control. Okay, so that's why I want to talk about this more in the future. But the basic system of mind control programming is that the programmer has to put down and continually control the victim. They have to continually do that. Okay, and what's one of the best ways to put down somebody? Through pain and fear. And so if I'm going to be a hireling and I want to keep all of my congregants under my authority, I'm going to have to scare them through things like saying that eternal security is not real, you know, that you can lose your salvation if you don't listen to me. And if you, if you, you know, do whatever, I'll excommunicate you. I'll, we'll shun you. We'll do all these things like this, you know, have a system of fear there where they're not fearing God, they're fearing me. You know, see, that's a system of control. And I can also put people down through my superior intellect and, and education and everything else. Mind control is all around us, folks. It is, it is so pervasive in our society. I go to Hollywood parties or, you know, occasionally I go to Oscar parties and things like that. And people, big stars, people will grab me by the arm and take me aside and say, I just want to thank you for the things you say. <laughs> and it blows my mind, but that, that's the culture. It's a culture of fear for sure. Um, you know, and, and it's a, a big culture of uh, mind control too. MK Ultra mind control rules in Hollywood. If if you don't know, Google that and look into it. Well, we've talked about Operation Mockingbird, MK, my, MK Ultra mind control stuff from, I mean, this goes back decades and decades. But Roseanne, I mean, do you know people have been blacklisted? So I'm going to be doing some more stuff on this in the future, but we want to get back to this book here. Here we have... Uh, I will see in my mind a human king chosen by God, our Lord himself, to whom all princes and all Christians pay reverence and obedience. Sounds like the Antichrist to me. It is my will to conquer all infidel lands and dress as I dress there, you know, talking about these things. You know, so you have dressing peculiar ways, you know, like priests or monks or Amish, Mennonites, Hutterite, Bruderhof. Um, but you, up here you have this thing about doing the will of your human king, and he goes out conquering and to conquer. Where did I hear that before? You know, the rider on the white horse, he goes forth conquering and to conquer. And this thing was written before the King James Bible. Interesting. Down here, if anyone would refuse the request of such a king, how he would deserve to be despised by everyone. Oh boy, get a hold of that one. What's the Bible say about in these end times, the, the time of, of Jacob's trouble, that the time will come when they that kill you will think that they do God's service? 
people are going to be going out and killing, hunting down uh, people that that are that don't make it to the rapture. You know that get saved after then. They're going to be hunted down as a criminal. Have your head cut off. Page sixty-eight. And by the way, you know I I had uh, someone send me an article, and I, I haven't had a chance to really check it out yet to verify if it's true or not. But uh, they're talking about down in Georgia bringing back the guillotine as a matter of, uh, or as a, as a, as a um, method, excuse me, method of the death penalty. How about that? Page 68. Christ our Lord, it is my will to conquer the whole world and all my enemies. Whoever wishes to come with me must labor with me so that following me in suffering, he may also follow me in glory. But you see it again. He's, he's claiming that this is what Jesus says. He calls and says, no, he didn't. You know, conquer the whole world and all my enemies. You see, they're setting people up for the Antichrist 500 years ago. Incredible. Down here, to imitate thee. You see this all through the book, all through the spiritual exercises book. You know, there was a, uh, I forget which new version it was, but there were times where um, it talks about, you know, to follow uh, Christ and things like this, and this new version was changing it to imitate. I wonder who could be behind that. I thought this was interesting, kind of like, huh? Page 71, the first point is to see the persons, Our Lady and St. Joseph, the servant girl and the child Jesus after his birth. The servant girl? There was a servant girl there for Jesus being born? Never heard of that. Page 72. The third point is to smell and taste in my imagination the infinite fragrance and sweetness of the divinity and of the soul and of its virtues and of all else. You smell the nice cookies coming out of the oven before they become the consecrated hosts. Well, don't get me wrong, I like the smell of cookies, but uh, I don't like the smell of consecrated hosts. There you have, imitate him again. Page 77. I will now address a colloquy to uh, Our Lady, and I will ask her to obtain for me from her Son and Lord the grace that I may be received under his standard. Imitating him, I can suffer them without sin. Okay? So again, you see this thing. Praying to Mary, suffering things on your own to obtain salvation. Page 78. Free themselves of the money they acquired. Be able to save their souls. Okay, uh, I'm going to be showing more on this in the future. I think I might have referred to it before, but uh, in the in the future, I'm definitely going to be showing this this thing of uh, freeing yourself of money that you've acquired. There are many of these cults, these satanic cults like the Hutterites or the Bruderhof or Amish. Many times, um, not so much the Mennonites because they're extremely greedy for money. Uh, having grown up, and my grandparents were Mennonites, so don't tell me about it, you know. But uh, the fact is, a lot of these orders, these religious orders, you go to them and you give up all your money. The Bruderhof and the Hutterites, uh, definitely, you're giving up all your money, and you basically earn no money at all. And you know, you go into the Jesuits, it's the same thing. You enter the Jesuit university, you're not allowed to have any kind of debt you know, personal debt, like financial type of debt of uh, cars or houses or whatever else. You know, student loan debts are okay. I'll show you that in another study coming up. But here you go again, you have page 80, you know, meditate on these different things. You have the Sermon on the Mount. Look out for that. All these cults out there, these Catholic type cults, they all just love the Sermon on the Mount. I've talked about that in other studies. Here again, you have the eternal salvation of my soul, saving yourself. They must meet with the approbation of our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church, and not be bad or repugnant to her. Okay? I don't think I'm going to have a very good chance at Catholic salvation then, because I'm quite sure that I'm very repugnant to a lot of Catholics. Down here we have, uh, this is page 84. 
The devout soul without question and without desire to question follows what has been manifested to it. And it goes down here to about, talk about to save his soul. He chooses some life or state within the bounds of the church that will help him in the service of God our Lord and the salvation of his soul. Again, look at the philosophy here. You see the mind control philosophy? You're a member of the church. You know, do things without question and without desire to question. You shouldn't even desire to question anything. I mean, you should not have a copy of this book for yourself. I mean, do you realize that's what it was for the majority of the Dark Ages and things? People couldn't even read, much less have their own copy of the Bible. You see, because this Bible leads to independent thought, and we mustn't have independent thought. You shouldn't even desire to question those in authority. What is it? Mind control. That's what this whole system is. That's why I get so rabid and so radical and I'm getting mad and everything else and I get sarcastic and stuff because I hate mind control. I believe in freedom. I believe in the priesthood of the believer. I believe that every Christian out there is going to be accountable to God. Why? Because the Bible says so. Okay? I am not lording over any of you. I am not saying, you don't question me. How dare you? I'm your bishop. You know, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. My desire is to see all members of the body of Christ, those who are truly saved, brought up to a level of understanding where they understand the scriptures just as good as I do, if not better. Page 85. Here he talks about his mind's eye again. The salvation of my soul, at the same time I must remain indifferent and free from any inordinate attachments so that I am not more inclined or disposed to take the things proposed than to reject it. Again, talking about the salvation of his soul. Down again, the salvation of my soul. So again, you're not supposed to have any emotions or feelings at all. You're just supposed to cut yourself off from anything that prohibits you from the salvation of your own soul. There it says on page 86, taking the above mentioned rules as my guide for eternal salvation and peace. Not one mention, by the way, of faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, you can pause that and read it if you really want to. There's nothing in there saying Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Put your faith in that and you can be saved. Not a word. Okay, this is the uh, third week now. The exercise, it says here, He washed their feet and gave His most holy body and His most precious blood to His disciples. Okay, uh, well, I've talked about that in other, you know, the, the study I did on uh, 13 reasons why every Christian must reject them, or, uh, yeah, every Christian must reject the, the Mass. And, you know, I, I make the point there where they say that the first Mass, the first Eucharistic uh, ceremony, was actually performed at the Last Supper. Okay, well, uh, Jesus was physically present then, so why didn't he just say, take a bite out of my arm and drink some blood? His most holy flesh and blood was there, wasn't it? Kind of strange system that they have there. It says here, the third prelude is to ask for what I desire. Here it will be to ask for sorrow, affliction, and confusion. Doesn't the Bible say that God is not the author of confusion? Why are you supposed to ask for confusion in the third week in the exercises? Page 92. I may make three colloquies, or colloquies, whatever. One with the Blessed Mother, one with the Son, and one with the Father. <laughs> so I guess the Holy Spirit's out. You know, don't say anything to Him. You know, replace the Holy Spirit with the Blessed Mother. Again, I think this was interesting. Page 93, Judas gave him the kiss of peace. Chapter and verse on that, please. Page 94. It says, I will rather rouse myself to sorrow, suffering, and deep pain, frequently calling to mind the labors, burdens, and sufferings of, that Christ our Lord bore from the moment of his birth up to the mystery of his passion, which I am now contemplating. 
again, you're supposed to get into this deep trance-like state and you're supposed to feel this, this pain, you know, and uh, rouse myself to sorrow, suffering, and deep pain. It doesn't say in your imagination. Remember what we read earlier, it's supposed to be physical pain. So you go to these retreats, these Ignatian retreats, you're going to be tortured. And that's what MK Ultra does, by the way. They subject their, their you know, the poor victims to, to torture. And, then, you know, and, and again, these mind-controlled zombies are all through Hollywood. I mean, the, you have the video of uh, Al Roker and, uh, you know, on NBC, what is it, this morning or something like that. And this woman, she mentions the Holy Ghost and he just goes, and just like totally locks up. I'm Savannah Guthrie, alongside Matt Lauer and Al Roker. Will someone do the, the junior high hockey game? It's like this. You gotta make it real awkward. That's exactly how you he did it. You have to have a certain amount of distance between yes, the bodies exactly. in junior high. Yes, like they say in Catholic school, leave room for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> anyway, there is a lot of uh, memories today, actually. It's a big day in music history. 35 years ago today, Elvis Presley passed away, the king of rock and roll. And as Mark Cohn says in his great song, Walking in Memphis, there's a pretty little thing waiting for the king down in the...